Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for this opportunity to look into your word now. We just pray that you would use Pastor Izzy to speak to each one of us, Lord, to encourage us, uh, to help us walk more closely with you. We ask this now in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, guys, would you grab your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 2? We're going to continue. I'm going to keep my shades on. There's some really bright windshields in, in the background behind you guys. So you have like silhouettes, halos, some of you over in this side, looking very angelic this morning. But we're going to be in Romans 2 where we're going to continue. We got to, to verse 4 where we saw that it's not judgment. When people are judgmental, um, it doesn't lead people to Christ. And we saw in, the, in verse 4 it says, Do you think lightly of the riches of God's kindness and his tolerance and his patience, not knowing that it's the kindness of God that actually leads you to repentance. It's, um, it's weird, but for some reason, some Christians think it's their duty to be the judges of everyone. And we went over this last week in detail. You know, when they, you know, they hear a list of sins, it's like all of a sudden they think they're on the God squad and they need to run around and blow whistles and, hey, that person's doing this and that person's doing that. And this is when in fact it's really God's kindness that makes us repent, not judgment that's brought upon us. And so Paul is, Paul is building an argument here to explain that really God is the only one fit to be the judge. Of all men, n- we're none qualified for that, wearing that hat. And when it comes to judging spiritual sin in another person, we can't really do well at that because we can't see into the heart. And the Lord Jesus he, is a, he, he cuts right through the baloney that men put up and, and they, they, they'll compare themselves. The Bible says actually you err when you compare yourselves one with another because some men will say, well, I'm better than that person over there. I do it better than that one over there. And, you know, that one over there isn't my measuring stick. Who's my measuring stick as a Christian? Jesus. And if I'm going to measure up to him, I already know I, I'm not going to make the full measure because he was perfect and I'm not. And the Bible, as we're going to continue in Romans, we'll see all of us, it says in the next chapter, chapter 3, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So there's not this attitude of I'm coming to God because I'm so good, I'm so righteous. I'm coming to God because I need help. You know, I, I, I have sinned. I, by the way, some churches, it seems like they want to drill you with the idea you have sinned. Does anyone here have problems that, with that idea that we've sinned? Because usually I never have anybody going, that's a big worry, Pastor. I, I, they already know that. I don't have to teach them that they have sinned. What I have to teach is what to do about the sin. You know, the solution for the sin is what we crave because that's what's called the good news, the gospel. And today we're going to see Paul is going to actually declare that he has his own gospel. Some people don't take note of this. It's right here in chapter 2. But he's going to say, according to my gospel, Paul speaking. Now, don't get freaked out by that. Matthew had the gospel, the first book of the New Testament. If you read the title, it says, the gospel according to Matthew. Or if you have an older rendition, it says, the gospel according to St. Matthew. And then, what's the next book? The gospel according to Mark. And the gospel according to Luke. And the gospel according to... John, but some folks don't understand that Paul, the apostle, says he has his own gospel too. They don't recognize it because we have so many of Paul's letters written in the Bible. Um, They get classed as epistles, the fancy word for letter. You know, you have to learn a whole new lingo when you become a Christian. They have Christianese. You don't just say a letter. Paul sent a letter. No, you say an epistle, okay? And he wrote these epistles that, that, okay, which he calls, today we're going to see the message. See, gospel just means good news, the message, the good message. And Paul says he's got a message for us. And let me share it with you this morning because it's encapsulated right in this next paragraph that he writes. 
in here, in the next two, well, two paragraphs, he's going to write that, don't you know it is God's kindness that leads us to repentance? But because he says, you have, um, well, something inside, a stubborn and an unrepentant, what? Heart. He says, because of it, you're storing up for yourself wrath. In the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. It says, who will render to each person according to his deeds? And to those that by perseverance in doing good, they seek for glory and honor and immortality, they get eternal life. But to those that are selfishly ambitious and they don't obey the truth, but they obey unrighteousness, what are they storing up for themselves? It says wrath and indignation. There's a word. Any of you use that in a sentence this week? <laughs> indignation. Yeah, I use that all the time. Wrath, maybe, yes. But not indignation. What is indignation? Anyone know what that is? Indignant? Some people, what? It doesn't sound good, does it? But indignation is a, is a anger with righteousness. It's... um. An anger that is turned towards an injustice. Okay, it's um, when you see somebody do something that is unjust. Someone harming a, a little child. Doing heinous things to a little one. Or, or to a, something brutal to one of the women. We, 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 I was told just last night some, some homeless guys raped a girl right over there in the bushes. And indignation would be the righteous reprisal of that act it would be setting it right to to that but see god is the only one that could really make the right call knows all the details no it was going in righteousness he would judge the situation but don't think he won't bring wrath against things that are unright you know by the way this is one of the points of the gospel that i'm really happy about because I don't know about you, but sometimes I see bad guys get away with really bad stuff. And I, I grew up in an era when, in the movies in Hollywood, they used to make the bad guys bad. And the good guys good. And at the end, the good guys won. Today, they make the bad guys kind of good. Kind of like family men. And the good guys are a little bit corrupt, but they're on the, supposedly on the good side. And, and then... You can't help it. They make the bad guy kind of nice, you know, and pretty soon you're rooting for the bad guy to get away with his bad stuff because the good guy's a jerk. And it kind of twists the morality of the whole thing. But I can tell you there are some movies where I watch and I see the bad guy doing bad, and when the good guy finally gets him, I don't know about you, but inwardly, what does it make your heart feel? I'm like... Yes, that guy deserved it. You know, that, that guy was a crumb. How dare he do that to those women? Or how dare he do that to the child? I, I want the bad guy to get his just dessert. But see, the only one qualified to dish that out is God. And so Paul says, God will take care of it. Now he quotes a verse in verse 6. I don't know, some of you, your Bibles have... Um, uh, like maybe a different font that they use or italics or, or parentheses they put around it and, and, or they put it in bold and you wonder why is all of a sudden the words look a little different? You know, the typeset is, is changed for this one particular verse compared to all the verses uh, around it. And that's because it's a quote. It's a direct quote and this particular quote comes to us from Psalm 62, verse 12. It's the last verse of Psalm 62. And if you... If you're a student of the Psalms, we're actually studying the Psalms on, on Tuesday evenings, and it's just beautiful. Because I'm going in detail over, you know, not just reading the Psalm, but reading what was going on, you know, like some of the clues that we get given in the Psalms, if you read in the Hebrew, they tell you um, this is a Psalm David wrote when he was in the cave hiding from Saul. Okay, the, the psalm, that, and that's the one we just studied this slide. It came out, it was just beautiful once you know the story. So we take a little time and, and look at Samuel and see the story, what was going on with David, and then read that psalm and you see stuff you didn't even notice if you read it before. Because it just brings it to light. 
Well, this psalm, Psalm 62, is a psalm of David also. But Paul is quoting it. And interestingly enough, he's quoting it saying, God is going to take care of giving, well, I don't know about you, but does it sound good to get glory and honor and immortality and everlasting life? Anyone in for that? Like, is that like on your bucket list? That's a good thing to put down at the bottom, you know, for ending well. I'd love to go out with all those. Glory, honor, immortality, and eternal life. What a way to end up. Okay? That's, that's awesome. To the one who's doing good, he says, that's what awaits them. What about the one doing wickedness? Doing unrighteousness. He says, they've got uh, something to look forward to. Wrath and indignation but he quotes the psalm this god who will judge with righteous judgment he will render to each person verse 6 says according to his deeds now if you would turn with me to psalm 62 it's a short psalm it's one of those ones made into a song for the for the um choir director and uh it's one that david wrote my, the title in the Hebrew is, is God Alone is a Refuge. He takes care of treachery and oppression. Anyone ever feel oppressed? Like, uh, like Aaron was sharing, being in the chute of, the, uh, <laughs> of Star Wars with the, with the trash compactor coming in and the stuff coming up to get you from the creature from below. And this is, um, David had a lot of experiences where I think, you know, whoever's writing Star Wars must have read the Bible a little. They stole some stuff from his life. I mean, the, the, the hardships he went through, they really did rip off some Bible stories. In their, They just retold them. Changed the name. Same trash compactor. You know, same pressures. Same wicked villain. All coming after him. And here David says that to the choir director, sing this song. He says, sing the song that my soul waits in silence for God only. For him... From him, he says, is my salvation. He is my only rock, my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will you assail me, O man, that you may murder him, all of you, like a leaning wall, like a, a tottering fence? They have counseled only to thrust him down from his high position. They delight in falsehood. They bless with their mouth, but inwardly they what? He says they curse. He said, oh, my soul, wait in silence for God only, for my hope is from him. This is the, we'd say, the chorus of the song. He repeats it. He's my only rock, my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be shaken. He's the one we have to, that rock that we can, that place of refuge we can stand firm on no matter what's going on. And then he says, trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before God. For God is is a refuge for us. David is telling the choir director, tell people to trust in God. How, how often? All the time. Put your heart before him. Because God is our refuge. He's our safe haven. He's the place we can go to when we have trouble. And if you've had a week like Aaron did or myself, you know that trouble just doesn't... In this life, do we have troubles? As Christians, I mean, become a Christian. You won't have any trouble, right? Is that the gospel? No. What did Jesus say? In this world, you shall have tribulation. Not you might. I wish he would have changed that, you know. Like, maybe you wouldn't have it. But no, he says you will. In fact, he says, if they'd done this to you, he said, I'm the master, right? If they did this to me, the leader, and you're just the followers, well, what makes us think that Somehow, they beat up our leader. They didn't just beat him up. They crucified him. They tortured him. They whipped him. And if they did that to him and he was perfect, what are they going to do to us as his followers that are imperfect? I mean, we're, why are we so surprised when somebody doesn't like us? Or somebody speaks evil of us? Or somebody does some crazy thing and we're like, oh, I didn't think that was going to happen. I'm a Christian now. Wake up. David says, tell the people to trust God all the time, including the times when bad stuff happens, because God is our place of refuge. 
He's the place we can go to that's our safe, our safe haven when this bad stuff happens. Now listen, this psalm ends with the verse he quotes. Verse it starts at verse 11. It's just one. 11 and 12 are actually just connected in the Hebrew as one continuous run-on. So it starts with this. And some of you might want to jot this one down and put it in, maybe at the front of your fridge because it says, once God has spoken, and twice I've heard this. Okay, this is a Hebrew way of kind of putting emphasis. Once God said this, um, and twice I heard it. Okay, it's their Hebrew way of saying, you might have heard this a couple times. That power belongs to God and loving kindness, mercy is also his. And it says, you will recompense a man according to his what? To his work. You're going to pay to whatever the man does, you'll recompense him. You'll make the right payment for what he's done. Now, is that good news? That God will recompense all men according to their work? He says, I heard this once. God said it. Maybe twice I heard it. How many of you have heard that? God's going to pay back. If you haven't heard that, I get to tell you that today. God is going to pay each man according to what he does. You want to do wickedness? You get wrath and indignation. You want to do what's upright? Do what's good? You got a really good bucket list coming your way. Because what did he say in Romans? You get to have glory, honor, immortality, eternal life. That's what you get for doing what's right. So you're like, you Christians are weird. You try to do good all the time. What if you're wrong? <laughs> then I spent my life doing good. What's so bad about that? I mean, really. What? You know, it's so weird because sometimes you... You just have to play the devil's advocate with them because they, they think they're so smart saying, you know, you're wasting your time being so good. Really? Because when you do good to people, what happens? You, you, good comes back. I mean, the Bible says whatever you sow, that's what you reap. So let me see. You're saying I'm stupid for being good and reaping good from my b being good. And if there is no God, all I did was get the benefit of being good and getting good back in this life. And that's not good enough for you? Because what happens if you're a jerk and you do evil in this life to people and there's no God? How good, so, how good does your life go? I mean, come on. The people are really good at being jerks. They usually get a knuckle print once in a while. I mean, they usually get some bad comes back to them for their jerkiness. And they're like, well, I can't believe this bad thing happened. Well, you were a jerk. <laughs> what I hate is Christians who act like jerks and then say, I'm just being persecuted for Jesus. <laughs> no, you're being persecuted because you're a jerk. <laughs> Don't use Jesus as a cloak for your jerkiness. Stop it. That's not, that's not what the Bible teaches you to do. The Bible says if you're a jerk, acknowledge it. In fact, it says to acknowledge all of our sin before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm a jerk. Forgive me. And it says if we confess our sins in 1 John 1, 9, he'll be faithful and righteous because that's how he is to, to do what? He'll forgive us our sins and he does one more thing. What's he do? He cleanses us of all unrighteousness. He cleans us up. But you can't stand there and be a jerk and say, I'm a Christian jerk. And everyone's just picking on me because I'm a jerk. Well, no, they're picking on you, not because you're a Christian, because you're a jerk. And you need to clean it up. You need to understand, it's whatever you sow, that's what you reap. Now, I can play the devil's advocate to the people who say, well, you're wasting your time, Pastor. What if there's no God? I tell them, what if there is? What if there is? You spent your whole life doing wickedness and do you know that once it was said, God said it? Maybe twice we heard it. See, I like the end of this psalm. That's how Psalm 62 ends. Once God said it, twice I heard this thing. And what did he hear? That God is going to r recompense every man according to how that man was. 
you're going to get paid for the way you were. It's the classic end of the good way to end the movie. Whatever the bad guy did, he's going to get the he's going to get his lumps. Whatever the good guy did, he's going to get the prize. He gets the girl, he gets to ride off into the sunset, live happily ever after, right? I mean, the this this idea isn't new. God declared this a long time ago. He said it a long time ago. But see, it says he's full of loving kindness. Mercy. Mercy's not giving us what we deserve. He's overlooking what I deserve for my sin and saying, I'm not going to give you that because I have this other thing called grace. And that's where I give you what you don't deserve. I give you these blessings. I give you this eternal life. I give you this forgiveness that you need. So Paul quotes this this psalm. He knows the psalm. Man, he's a Pharisee of Pharisees. He's, he's just quoting to the guys, look, God said this. It's going to happen. Now listen to what he builds from this. He says, therefore, there in verse 9, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil. To the Jew first, he says, but also to the Greek, the Gentile. He says, but there'll be glory and honor and peace. Oh, he threw this one in. That wasn't in the earlier four. Did you see that? Glory and honor, yeah, that, those were there. But, but now he added peace. Glory, honor, and peace to everyone who does good. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Did you know besides getting glory and honor, immortality, eternal life, you get this other thing he adds right here. Peace. Anybody need peace? See, Jesus said, my peace I give you, my peace I leave you. It's not like the world gives. No matter what you're going through, you'll have my peace. I'll, I'll give you the peace that I'll be with you. Not that you'll have an absence of conflict. That's Webster's def definition. Peace, absence of conflict. No, peace is knowing who's with you in a conflict. We have the creator walking with us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. What's he say in Psalm 23? I fear no evil for who is with me? The Lord, thou art with me. The Lord is with us, so we don't have to stress out. We get glory, honor, and peace if we do good. Should I teach people to do good? I mean, I'm, I, I get the privilege to teach to the youth groups all the time, and it seems like at those teenage formative years, it's really good that some older ones speak into their lives and say, <clears throat> you need to do good. How, how many times do we have to tell teenagers to do good, by the way? <laughs> is it like a one-time message and they got it? You know, it's, it's amazing how teenagers seem to think, hey, you told me that already. I got it, right? And, and do they get it? I mean, parents, help, help out here. Do they really get it on one shot, one time? Just do good, son. Do good, daughter. Just, just keep doing good. And you'll get glory and honor and peace. And, oh, it's, it's marvelous. How many, times, how many times do you think ministers have to revisit this, this idea? Daily. You know, call up, Pastor, I'm having a crisis here. This person at work did me wrong. I just want to kill him. What do you think I should do? Let me see. My Sicilian size says kill him, but that's not Jesus. So don't tell you I said that. Because if you say that, they'll be like, the pastor said I could. <laughs> no. You're supposed to do good. I got to tell you again. It's so funny when people call. Sometimes they're calling because they want to do evil, but they know they're not supposed to. So they just want you to tell them, don't do it. Do what's right. What do you get? How many times do we need a reminder that when we do good, there's a payoff? I mean, sometimes Christians forget the payoff. That's why I like Romans 2. It tells you the payoff for doing good. See, how many of you, I know I'm not like coming up with a brand new idea that I just taught that you've never heard before, that God is going to recompense everybody for anything that they do. I mean, how old is that idea? I mean, that's as old as dirt, man. That's from the beginning. God said it. And he heard it a couple times. 
You all probably heard this. But what we forget is the payoff. You forget that you get peace when you do what's right. You forget that you get glory and honor from the Lord when you do what's right. When you do good, there is a seriously great recompense for doing good. Why do we have to teach our kids to constantly? Why do we have to reiterate for them to do good? I mean, seriously, do we have to reiterate? Do, do you stop telling your kids to do good? I told them once, that's enough. Child rearing 101, I'm done. Really? Has it worked, Mom? One time you told the boys, that's it? They did good ever since? Oh, that we would have kids like that. If you had one, everyone would be like, so jealous. <laughs> Where'd you get them? You know, I, have a, I, 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 I do have a remarkable son, tender-hearted to the Lord, but he still needs to be reminded to do good, especially when someone wrongs him. The Sicilian blood came through. Genetics is a cruel master. He's not even full. He got, he got half a mom. She's German, though. They got some brutal get-backs, too, you know. The thing is, is that flesh is flesh. Sin is sin. And we need encouragement to just keep us sober-minded to think, you know what? In the end, God's going to repay all this. Sometimes we get blinded by that in the midst of our daily life, in the day-to-day -day grind. We forget the big picture that someday God's going to repay every work you've done. So Paul says this. Look at this. He goes on to say, for with God, he's going to give these things. And with him, he says in verse 11, there is no partiality with God. He doesn't play favorites. He will recompense everyone right. No partiality. He says, for all who have sinned without the law, they perish without the law. You ever wonder what would happen to someone who doesn't know about God? And they die. I, I get this question. Well, what about the pygmies in Africa who don't know about Jesus and they die? Are they going to be going to hell just because they didn't believe in Jesus because they never heard? I said, are you really concerned about the pygmies in Africa? You should go. <laughs> no, that's not what I mean, Pastor. Well, you seem so concerned. But what about the one who does not know, doesn't, has never heard? Listen, Paul answers it right here. You can highlight this for answering somebody. To the one who has sinned without the law, it says they perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law, they'll be judged by the law. Talking about the law of the, 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 the Levitical law, the Ten Commandments that were broken down into 613 Levitical statutes in the book of Leviticus. You get the book with all the rules and you don't follow the rules, guess what? You get to be judged by those rules. Because verse 13, he says, it is not the hearers of the law that are just before God. It is the what? The doers of the law that will be justified. Now he says, when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law. You know, the law says we're to love God. We're to love our neighbor. You know, I know some people who don't know any of the Bible things and they're more loving than some Christians. I hate to say it. It's a shame on us Christians. We should, this should never outdo us in love. But there are some people just way kinder, way more loving. And you think, wait a minute. They instinctively do what the Bible teaches to do. And they don't even know it says to do it. Let me show you what Paul says about those people. When those people do instinctively the things of the law, these not having a law, he says, are a law unto themselves. They, they just live it. And in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience, it says, bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing, or the old King James says, or excusing. My Bible says, or defending. Your thoughts either accuse you or excuse you. He says, and on that day, he says, when according to my gospel... God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Paul says, according to my gospel, who gets to be the judge of men's secrets? 
See, we judge on some outward things, but we don't know the inward. Jesus said, guys, you think you're so righteous, but if, if, you, if you have hate toward your brother, you're mad at him, you say, raka, that's Hebrew for empty-headed. That's literally what it means, but we, we translate to fool. You ever said that to anyone, you fool? He says, you're guilty enough for damnation. It's like you killed him. You fool. I, oh, man, I must. I, if I, Jesus said, if you look on a woman with lust in your heart, it's like you committed adultery already. I am a murderer and an adulterer by Jesus' words. Maybe I didn't do it physically, but let's get real. How many of us have ever thought empty-headed or ever lusted? Because if you have, Jesus looks at the heart. And according to Paul's gospel, Paul's gospel now, you can, you can make a note here. Here's, see, I, always, I never caught this, but it, my wife, sometimes she would say certain things, and it sounded kind of Christianese. It was kind of like, seems like it could be a verse, and I'd be like, where's that in the Bible? She goes, oh, it's not in the Bible, it's in the gospel according to Jan. <laughs> she had her own gospel. A lot of it had to do with Izzy, stuff he needed to do, but... But it was in there. In her own gospel, she had the gospel. Ask her. She did. She had the gospel according to Jim. And, and, and she says, I have one too. But now I actually kind of feel like, hey, wait a minute. I never really thought of this. Paul has his own gospel. And according to his gospel, which means good news, what he was proclaiming, he was saying, guys, according to the good news I'm proclaiming to you, Who's going to be the judge that judges the secrets of men's hearts? God. Through Christ Jesus, he says, there's only one guy who gets to do this. And whether we realize it or not, that is really good news, gospel. That's the best good news we can give to someone sometimes is just to say, hey, don't sweat it. God's going to judge rightly. It's been said once, you know, he said it, and it's been heard a few times. Yeah, heard that before. But somehow we need a reminder. Paul put it in his gospel right here. God, you didn't know he had a gospel, did you? You just thought he had epistles. Romans chapter 2, right there, according to his gospel, it's God that gets the job to judge the secrets of men through, it says, Christ Jesus. Now, thankfully, it's through Christ Jesus. Let me just revisit that. That's really important here. Because the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, and old things have done what? Passed away. Behold, he makes all things what? New. So if you give your heart to Jesus, he goes, I'm starting over with you. We're going to, we're, we're going to, Make you a new creature, born again. Your, your new life has begun. And all those stuff you've done in the past, what does he do? Erase. We're just going to get rid of that. Because see, unless he does that in our lives, there are some people that are so bound by the things of their past, their mistakes, they can never move forward. They, they, they want to, but there's hurts. There's deep wounds. There's, there's mistakes that they've made. And there's condemnation that they feel for those mistakes. And it just keeps haunting them. So Paul says God's going to judge through his son. And if you're in his son, then his son has already taken care of all those mistakes because we go to him and confess our sins and he's faithful. He's just, he forgives us he cleanses us so now i get to stand before him and go hey this is going to be pretty cool i i actually don't fear going before the lord on judgment day when i read the passages about you know in revelation that we're all going to stand before him some you guys know that right it says in revelation every man we get to stand before god and we're going to be recompensed that's just well paul's gospel but it's not just paul John writes it for us in the book of Revelation that we're all going to stand before the Lord. We're all going to be judged. He's going to take the sheep and put them to the one side, right? And what's he going to do with the goats? The other side. And to the sheep, he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servants. Enter into my rest. 
to the goats, he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Now, I don't know if you've read that passage, but the first time I read it, I said, Lord, I'll make sure I'm on the side. Which side was it again? So on your right, okay, when I get to heaven, I make sure I look up at him, and the right is that side, I'm going over there. <laughs> you know, I'll make sure I'm on the correct side. I don't know what I'm saying. Depart from me, I never knew you. You're a worker of iniquity. But you know, Jesus said not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, is going to be saved. Just because you name drop Jesus doesn't get you in. You know that, right? Do, are, are there name droppers in our culture that drop the name of Jesus and act like, hey man, I'm in, and, but they don't live it. I, I just am here to tell you, Paul, according to his gospel, they might look good, they might say the right thing on the outside, but inside, the secret of their heart, let me, let me assure you, there is one judge good enough to do the job and he will judge them according to the gospel of Paul. He'll see right through it. You can't, that's why I tell people, you can't know the Lord. He sees everything. Why, why waste so much time and energy trying to? You just wasted, you're spinning your wheels. Stop it. As we're going to see next week, all we got to do is, well, two weeks from now, Next week, those guys will do communion, which is a great celebration of the washing away of our sins. And that, that'll bolster your faith. And then you get to hear Aaron share about, uh, please read in Acts chapter 10 to 12, the, the part where Peter has a vision of a sheet come down from heaven. And the Lord's going to tell him, arise, Peter. He's hungry. It was about noon. They were making food. He's up on the roof. You guys know the story, right, in Acts? He's up there. If you're up on the roof in Israel and they're cooking underneath you, where's all the, the smell? You know, when my nona used to cook, you didn't want to be close to the house if you were hungry. Because just the smell, your mouth would just like gush. You like, like the tongue would start watering. You'd be like, oh man, how long till dinner? But I was fortunate. My, my grandmother, she made, um, always there was sauce simmering, you know, in the in the pan and fresh baked bread and we were not taught like some people my friends they were like you can't even take a, a snitch until dinner until everyone is seated around the table don't sl they slap their hand if they try to get an olive or something you know my nona would put the bread and the olives on the table and she would say if you're hungry what we do is we go get a little bowl and we would put the sauce in there and we would take the fresh bread and we'd dunk it in there and put a little Parmesan cheese, and now I'm hungry. Forget it. What was the message? I we, would, we would just eat before we ate. And there was no rule about that. You were allowed to do that. And you felt loved. It just, like, it was, it was good. Well, Peter's on the roof, and they're cooking below him, and he's hungry, and the Lord says, I'll take this opportunity to talk to you, Peter. You got a little bit of shortcomings. See, Peter was a Jew. And I'm sure Aaron will go into this more detail next week. But did the Jews think that us Gentiles were included in the whole God's plan of salvation? No. It was like exclusive. We're in the exclusive club. We're the ones God sent the Messiah to. We're the ones that he came to save. And you Gentiles are Gentile dogs. And you don't count. So the Lord was going to say to him, Peter, what I call clean, don't you call what? Unclean. Unclean. Now, I, I just stole Aaron's message, so you know what it's about. Bring your friends. No, he's got some pretty cool insight he was sharing. I, that, I'm just teasing you. That's the, the what do they call it, preview? The, the uh, wet your appetite for next week. Read Acts 10 to 12, and then he'll share from that something that the Lord shows Peter that, that we need to hear. So we keep a right perspective about the people God puts around us. Because we have a really great God. A God who knows his job and does it great. And sometimes we just need to be reminded. You just got to remember, at the end, don't worry about that bad guy. You're, you're stressing out too much about him. Some of you are really stressing out about some evil thing that's gone down, maybe against you. And you just need a little word of comfort. That Don't worry, the Lord's going to take care of that guy. Or that gal that did that to you. He'll handle it. Just turn it over to him. 
Go back and read Psalm 62 tonight when you go to bed. And listen, just listen for the parts where David is saying God was his refuge when all that junk was coming against him. He was the place he would run to when the trash compactor was closing in on him. And the creature was coming up in Star Wars underneath it to eat him. He's like, God, you're the one that saves me. You're my salvation. Let's hold fast to that. And to the unbelievers, I'm sorry you don't believe, but I hope someday your heart will change. Because God hasn't moved just because you don't believe in him. You know, some, some non-believers are so pompous. They think, look, I don't believe in God, so he therefore does not exist. Like somehow that's a real life argument. That's like saying, I don't believe in error because I can't see it. That's what they do. They tell me, I can't, I don't see God, so he can't be there. Have you seen gravity lately? You know, you want to use that nonsensical kind of argument. I'll use a sensical argument with you. You just go climb up on a high building and jump off. Tell me you don't see gravity. And you don't believe in anything you can't see. Okay, step off. I'm going to introduce you to this thing called gravity with a really quick, quick lesson. It has power over you that you can't see, but you'll feel it. And you may not see God, but you know what? He's way more powerful than gravity. In fact, he made gravity. You may not see him, but he's still there. And you saying, I don't believe, doesn't make him go away. Just like it doesn't make gravity go away. It doesn't make air go away. It doesn't, you know, you don't just say, I don't believe in gravity and start levitating. Watch this. I don't believe in it. Woo! Wouldn't that be awesome if you could do that? Some of you be trying it today. Let's do it. Go ahead, try. Saying, I don't believe in God doesn't make him go away. He's still there. And he's going to repay. So just remember that when you get down, you have a hard week, just think, somebody's doing you wrong, just go, you know what? The Lord's going to take care of it. In the big good movie, where the good guy's really good, and the bad guy's as bad as they are, don't worry, the good guy's going to win. According to the Gospel of Izzy, which he learned from the Gospel of Paul and Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. I learned it from here. But I put it in mine too. And some of you need to put it in yours so you can pass it on. Some people just, they, don't, they forget. They just need that last verse of Psalm 62 just to be reminded he's merciful, full of loving kindness and able and is going to recompense everybody according to their works. Let's just remember that so we keep the focus and keep going when we start feeling weak and feel like giving up. It'll help you, really. It really will. That's why it's good news. And that good news is what sustains us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the privilege that we get to crack it open here out on a beach in Hawaii. Lord, we get to have sand. <laughs> our brothers on the mainland must just laugh at us having sand on our Bible covers. But Lord, we're so grateful we get this wallpaper and we see a testimony of your handiwork all around us declaring how great our Creator is. And so help us to stay mindful of you this week. Help us to remember this message so that we can have that what we need to sustain us when we start growing weary. And we can turn over things to you when we're seeing wicked people do wickedness and it troubles us, Lord. We know you'll take care of it in the end. Comfort our hearts with that as we go from here. We ask that now in Jesus' name. And everyone that agree with me said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me and listen to a closing song and send you off in the joy of the Lord today? And uh... Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.